Welcome to episode 18 of the RSA Resident and Student Podcast Series, a production of the American Academy of Emergency Medicine Resident and Student Association. RSA is an accessible, collaborative organization that fosters innovation, education, and advocacy for residents and students in emergency medicine. In this episode, Dr. Pooja Gopal, resident at University of Illinois at Chicago and RSA Education Committee Chair, speaks with Dr. Jan Schoenberger, Program Director at Los Angeles County USC Medical Center, and Dr. Edward Ullman, Director of Undergraduate Medical Education and Fellowship Director for Medical Education Fellowships at Bath Israel Deaconess Medical Center Group. Today, Drs. Gopal, Schoenberger, and Allman discuss how to develop niches within the field of emergency medicine. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another edition of AEM RSA Podcast. I'm Pooja Gopal, a current resident at University of Illinois at Chicago and current vice chair of the AAEM Education Committee. I'm really excited to be bringing you this podcast directly from Fort Lauderdale at CORD Academic Assembly 2017. And here today, I'm extremely honored to be introducing two really unique individuals and very well accomplished, very honored and lucky here. And I'm going to actually turn it over to them. Well, thanks, Pooja, for the opportunity. This is Jan Schoenberger. I'm from Los Angeles County USC Medical Center. I'm the program director there. And in terms of a little bit of background, and then I'm going to introduce my co-speaker here, I did my training at LA County USC. I'm kind of a lifer there, been there a long time. Then I stepped into the APD role at LA County USC in 2003, and I've been the program director there since 2011. So I'm very proud to be there, and it's a great place to work. And I'm here today with Ed Ullman, who's from completely across the country in Boston. So Ed... Yes, we kind of bookended our talk here. My name is Edward Ullman. I'm at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, one of the Harvard affiliates. And I trained at the University of Virginia and got really excited about medical education during that time and then came up to Boston and started at the clerkship director. Now we've had a, a bunch of courses, so I'm now the director of undergraduate medical education as well as the fellowship director for medical education fellowship. Well, thanks for the opportunity to invite us to speak. We're talking today about being a content expert and developing your niche, which brings us to our first discussion point about whether it's called a niche or a niche. Ed, what do you think? It could be an East Coast, West Coast type of thing. Be. I don't know. I think for some reason, because I'm at the Ivory Tower, it must be niche. <laughs> oh, yes, because it sounds more European. It does. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to say niche because that sounds more West Coast and it's like without an accent and kind of plain. So. Anyway, however you say it, that's kind of what we're talking about today. Well, I'm from the Midwest, so I don't know which way to go now. But we're going to start off with our first question, and that is, what do you think is the importance of niche or niche development for educators, learners? Well, I think in the modern day of emergency medicine, it used to be you could just be this undifferentiated kind of person. You were excited about teaching or academics, and you joined in, and something would happen. And I think the days of that are really coming to a close. And you really need to show that you're a specialized person, you're a specialized learner, and have this great content to provide. And that is essentially developing your niche. There are different ways to develop it, but it's to become an expert at something that forwards your own career, which is an important thing for, I think, lifelong enjoyment. This whole conference is about resiliency. And it also will serve to promote you in your institution, or if you want to leave, to make you more accessible to other people. Yeah, I completely agree. I think developing a niche is, I'm converting, is an important way to go in terms of developing an academic profile. In the days of the past, it's true that if you were in the world of EM education, a lot of people were just omnivores. They sort of, you know, taught everything, studied everything. And now it's getting more difficult to distinguish yourself if that's sort of your approach. And it's really, it's just a lot easier, honestly, to develop a career if you do develop a niche and you can focus, focus your scholarly activities, focus your teaching, focus your interest on something a little more specialized. And it offers probably a little more value uh, to a department, for example, as they develop sort of a profile of academicians to have people that are focused in different areas. What are some examples of current niches in EM? Well, I think this whole conference is, in fact, one of the biggest ones, which is medical education. I think this is the kind of cutting edge, the new great idea that emergency medicine has kind of come around to that we need to learn how to educate. Their ultrasound is a great one that you hear all about, global health, used to be hyperbarics, pediatrics, 
the list goes on. In fact, most probably the best thing to do is you just get on the web and you can see just lists upon lists. Yeah, I think if you look at the lists of sort of fellowships that are out there, whether they're ACGM accredited or non-ACGM accredited, that's sort of a, a very great place to start in terms of the niches that are out there. In addition to that, I think there are niches that sort of come up as there are interests in our specialty. So, for example, right now, a really hot topic is resilience and wellness. And now that's going to be a niche for some of the people who have started those committees and are writing those papers. And they sort of jumped in. They had an interest. And now that's going to be that's where their career is going to be focused. I personally have been involved in palliative care for the last decade or so. And that was my personal niche. And it helps me focus, you know, what I'm going to be writing manuscripts on. I can combine palliative care and education, which is a great thing. So sometimes you can even sort of blend two things that you're interested in, and that can also provide even a new niche beyond the traditional ones. Are there some examples of new academic niches on the horizon? Having just mentioned the resilience and wellness, I think that's one that's new. As we're seeing technology emerge, we're seeing some also new niches of looking at technology and how it impacts medical education. That's one as well. Like I said, I think they kind of pop up as things evolve. So We even see that at CORD, since we're sitting here at CORD, of course, that's kind of on the brain. As new controversial areas come out, new committees form, you see niches coming out. And so I think we don't even know what the future ones are going to be. And that's what the challenge is for residents and future academicians is to keep your eyes open for an opportunity to develop a new niche and be a new leader almost instantaneously as you lead the charge in a new area that's of interest to everyone. In terms of getting involved in old niches that are out there, you know, it's hard sometimes. You know, you see like Amal Matu who does cardiology. Clearly, that's a great example of somebody who's picked an area. That's what he lectures on. He's written books about it. That's a classic example. Does that mean you should be staying away from an area like that where there's an established person? No, absolutely not. You can be a collaborator. Those people are great mentors to look to if they're doing something that you're interested in. But I do think that we don't even know what some of the new academic niches on the horizon might be. Would you agree? Yeah, I mean, I think... Jan really heightens an important aspect when you're looking at future niches is that it's a combination of things. It's not just what you love. It's what your program or what your chair is looking for. And it's something that you're actually fundamentally good at. It's that combination of things. And so oftentimes you don't realize that they're developing until you kind of just look at it. And so CORD is a great example of how when it originally started, it was really just kind of some basics of how to get promoted. And now they've broken up into so many tracks of so many different aspects of education. And within them, these niches are are bubbling up. So when you come to these conferences, you immediately learn that there's something else that somebody's doing in some other location. And you can bring it. And soon there's four or five, six people doing it. And now it's got some traction. Yeah. And now all of a sudden you have a group of collaborators and you find each other and you can start to do studies across sites or projects across sites. And So keeping your eyes open and looking for other people who are interested in what you're interested in will only help your development, not hurt you at all. What are some of the steps involved in establishing a niche? Well, I think the first thing is find out what you're passionate about. The world of academic emergency medicine is really driven a lot by by your own personal passion. Embrace it, like it, learn it. And then I think the next step is to find that mentor. Find someone who can shepherd you a little bit through the pathway. Because I think as a resident, you're just bombarded with information day after day after day after day. And sometimes it's hard to really see that forest. You're just looking at that next tree. You're just getting, you know, getting through that next night shift. And I think when you have a mentor who starts to hone your skills a little bit and understand that small things will lead to big things. And that's a very important thing. It took me a while to learn that if you're fascinated with procedural sedation, for example, I don't know why I picked that, but procedural sedation, and you're curious why one attending picks propofol, another attending picks atomidate, you've just created a great controversial question that probably exists in everybody's shop, right? And then you start studying that. And next thing you know, you're the procedural sedation person. It's as simple as that. Yeah, I would agree. At one of the lectures yesterday that I went to, Jonathan Davis from Georgetown gave a great story about how he sort of found his niche, which is male GU emergencies. And he started his talk by saying, like, it, it found me. Where I was training, we had to make a list of different things that we were interested in lecturing about. And, you know, number 35 out of 36 on my list was male GU emergencies, but that's what I got assigned. So I made this lecture, and then one thing led to another, and then another department wanted the lecture, and another department wanted the lecture. And pretty soon, that, like, if you look at my CV, most of my early talks and early papers and chapters were all on male GU emergencies, which all started from literally being assigned a lecture. So 
you know, sometimes they find you. Sometimes you seek them in terms of recognizing what your passions and skills are and then developing that further. Sometimes developing a niche means that you need specialty training, that you need to do a fellowship. But certainly, I think that the issue of mentorship is absolutely key. You know, finding somebody who does what you might want to do and connecting with that person to find out how they got where they are and what they see the horizon being is going to be a really important part of the development of your niche. Just to add on to that, that was a great talk, was exactly that. That was something that was needed by the department. And it's that understanding that he might not have had a passion for it. Fair enough. But he understood there was a need for the department. And he turned it into something that would clearly interested him enough to keep leveraging a talk and then a paper and then a book chapter. And that's often how things get developed within your own personal aspects of it. So it's always important to remember and keep your eyes open for when there's an opportunity to take it. Absolutely. And we have a slide in our talk that, Ed, why don't you share that concept? Because I like it. Sure. So this is if you're here in Fort Lauderdale, uh, it just won't be done by then. But anyways, on one of the things, it's a Venn diagram, and it really talks about how what is the perfect niche. And it's basically the combination of stuff that you love, stuff that you're good at, and stuff that someone will pay you to do, i.e. give you a job. And if you can combine those three, you don't have to have a love for all of them. But if you can combine them and it feels that something works for you, that is how you can really excel in that aspect one of the other concepts that comes up in this area is the concept, and we've heard it in lots of talks about parlay, parlay, parlay. So going back to the story of the male GU emergencies, you know, if you are asked to give a lecture, then turning that into some kind of a paper, turning that into a chapter, turning that into a way to connect to other people in the country who have written or spoken about that thing means that all of a sudden you turn this little thing and, and it snowballs into a bigger thing. And maybe that's going to be your niche. Maybe it's not. Maybe it leads to another one. But recognize that all of these scholarly outputs, whether it even be a local lecture, can be turned into a bigger thing. Yeah. One of my early mentors said, never do anything just once. The most effort you put is in that first talk, even if it's 10 minutes. Do that first 10-minute talk and then blow it out to a 30-minute talk and find people who are interested in this talk, whether it's your friend who you're visiting, just, hey, you don't have to pay for it, but can I give this talk to the residents? It still amazes me how much of an opportunity that actually exists. And next thing you know, you're writing a paper because two other people have thought about this. And it really is about just finding people in common who want to do that work. Another way that this can happen is by joining a task force or a committee. And then that task force or committee, all of a sudden you meet collaborators that are interested in the same, same thing you're interested in. Then the task force or the committee puts out a white paper or some kind of manuscript about what that committee has been working on. All of a sudden, your name is connected to some particular area of expertise. So it can even be that simple as, you know, if you're not even sure, then join a task force or a committee and to see if that maybe stimulates, you know, some kind of productivity. Sometimes that's how it happens as well. Any other final tips or suggestions for our listeners? Even though it seems like it can be daunting, the chances are you've delved into this part at some aspect and you just don't realize it. It's just harnessing a little bit that energy and maybe turning it a little in a different manner and driving forward with it. I think it is important if you want to do an academic that you don't necessarily have to be like, I've decided I'm going to be a Malma too, or I'm going to be the next sepsis researcher. You may start thinking like that, but it's important that if it's something that you enjoy to do and there's space for it is to go for it because those opportunities exist and these conferences are built on people driving forward. And, you know, for the residents out there who are thinking about entering academics, remember that as you enter academics, and a chair that you're interviewing with or someone asks you, you know, why are you interested in academics? And the only thing you can come up with, well, I just, I love to teach. That itself is a very common feeling and a very common answer. We all feel that way. But if you're a chair or you're a department head and you're looking at, you know, who you're bringing into the department, just loving to teach these days isn't quite enough to really build the foundation of an academic career. You really do have to have something that you're interested in, that you're interested in building a career. So identifying this early and recognizing that it's important in terms of entering the academic world will only benefit you and catapult your career that much faster. Yeah, I, would, I would echo, be careful of just saying, I love to teach. Make sure that you follow that up with, and I'm excited about whichever topic. Now your chair says, ah, okay, now we got someone who is a little bit more than I like to work with residents or I like the camaraderie. They kind of get that you're going to be a teacher of a particular topic. And hey, guess what? We actually are kind of looking for a expert on diabetes, uh, patient safety QI at our institution. There's, we got bodies and bodies all on top of each other all doing it. But you'll be amazed at what's available. 
And I think medical, for in our shop, I just say medical education started really with one person, and that was me. And now I have a group of four that work. And it was purely because we just kept doing it and kept showing little success and little success to the point that our chair couldn't say no when he reviews our small little group because all the pubs are there, the teaching is there. And so it was just a little snowball that just built up and built up and built up. And I think it's okay if you take a stab at this and you pick something early in your career and you, it turns out that, you know, either you hit a dead end or you kind of lose your passion for it or whatever. It's okay. You know, you can reinvent yourself. Um, that's also perfectly acceptable. Lots of people have done this over a career. It's always tempting to look at the first, you know, five years or 10 years. But remember that as you're entering economics, for many people, this is a 30, 40 year career. So, you know, think about the long term and it's okay if you need to switch directions at some point. That's that happens, too. That is a fantastic piece of advice is that in your academic career, you are not going to have one niche. You're likely going to have four or five niches. Can you blend them together? That's a phenomenal career. But otherwise, you're going to do something for a couple of years, then you're going to get promoted to something, and that is your new niche, and you try to put them together and you mentor up. But I think it's important to realize, and that's a great, is that even though you struggle, may struggle identifying your first niche, keep your eyes open. Just keep applying the same principle because there are just going to be many more out there in your career. Thank you so much, Dr. Schoenberger and Dr. Ullman. Those were some great pearls and wisdom I know I will be taking forward with me, and I know many listeners will be also. I want to thank you again for taking the time to speak with us and give us your knowledge and information, and I want to thank our listeners for tuning in, and we hope you join us next time. We hope you have enjoyed this podcast from the American Academy of Emergency Medicine Resident and Student Association. For more information about RSA, please visit our website, www.aaemrsa.org. Listen to all podcasts in this series and explore the ways you can get involved with RSA. Join us again next episode for another topic of importance for emergency medicine residents and students. 